Our next speaker is the founder of Recollect, and in her former life, she was a neuroscience who spent her day neuroscientist who spent her day looking inside people's brains. Please welcome up Alice Albrecht. So I want you to imagine the smartest person you know, and maybe the smartest person who's ever lived. Now imagine somebody that's even smarter than that. That's super intelligence, or SI. There's a lot of excitement right now about using AI to get us to SI. But there are other paths we can take. Many believe that we need to create an entirely new type of intelligence to get there, but I don't think that's actually true. We have several ways we can get there in different paths. The three paths I see are creating artificial intelligence, a, cre a completely new thing. We can augment an existing intelligence, namely ourselves as cyborgs. Or we could use collective intelligence, which you can think of as you and some friends coming together to solve a problem. Um, all of these uh, paths, out of all of these paths, we'll start with AI here. Many of you today are AI enthusiasts, but we all define it a little bit differently. The real goal of AI, though, is to get to human-level intelligence, and it's actually quite its a long journey on its own, and we're already on that journey right now. So these large language models like ChatGPT are artificial general intelligence, or what we're getting to, and they're coming on the heels of artificial narrow intelligence, which you can think of as those computer vision models that you were used to classify cats or dogs, say. Um, but we're still a long way from AI, this human-level one. And the barriers we have to cross are not just technological. Um, we have a lot of ethical and moral concerns about something that doesn't have to follow our social contracts, and we're already seeing bias in these models today. We also have very real technical hurdles. I used AI to generate all of these images, and this one was by far the hardest. This is an alternative use case task for, uh, to test humans' creative problem-solving abilities. I give it very explicit instructions. It could not even. Um, and so why are we spending all of this time trying to get to uh, this AI right now? We're really on this tale of Moore's law right now. So we've had a scale and a compute revolution. We haven't really had an algorithmic one, I'll argue. Um, but I think we will at some point. We just need to have different architectures and different models to get there. Well, why not start with humans? We have lots of us sitting around here today. Uh, part of the reason is that the understanding our own consciousness enough to be able to augment is really a hard problem, and it's been slower than some of the other fields of research. And also, there's lots of ethical implications on experimenting with humans. Even though we're very messy, I still think we should start with humans first. Collectively, we ha do have morality, and we can get around these problems of aligning machines and humans. And we give machines and algorithms different data than we would give a robot. But history has taken us down this AI path, uh, so I'll give you a quick lesson. Turing, in, the in 1950, decided to create a thinking machine and a test around that, and his colleague I.J. Good was the first to term superintelligence. Neither of them really considered humans as a starting point for this, though. And I don't blame them. The cognitive revolution didn't happen really till the 60s, and humans, like I said, are messy, and it's easier as an engineer to start from a clean starting point. But this clean starting point, starting with an artificial intelligence, did come back to bite them almost immediately. So very famously, in 1956, Marvin Minsky gathered a group of his colleagues together for a summer project to try to tackle these issues of creating a human-level intelligence. It's been about 70 years. We're still working on those problems. And then winter came. So through the 70s and 80s, we had an AI winter, and uh, cybernetics moved forward in medical fields to help to restore functioning for people, but not really uh, as cyborgs. And then we had the dream of the 90s and the early aughts. Here, AI research, we have this resurgence, and cyborgs are still relegated to being in this sort of sci-fi area. We have PCs, we have the internet, we have all of this data, and we have this huge digital economy that comes up around that. Um, all of this, though, is still using humans as a model. So a lot of the advances in AI take from neuroscience and cognitive science research because evolution did a really good job creating intelligence, it turns out, but it's very slow. We can speed that up, though. We can give ourselves an evolutionary boost now by taking these AI models and these tiny, fast computers and using those to augment our own capabilities. Here, I gave an AI model what was in my mind and created slides to cue my memory. So we're here. Um, and all joking aside, um, when I talk about this, people get a little squirmish at this point and think, oh, you're going to bore holes in my head. I think we're quite far off from that for commercial purposes. I'm really sorry, Elon. Um, but we can use behavioral data and biometric data to tie humans and machines together today. And we are already cyborgs. We use iPhones. We use things like GPS and the weather to make us more intelligent. We have wearables to tell us more about our performance and our bodies. And all of this without much to do about becoming more than human. 
So I know there's a lot of excitement around AI agents, but I hope some people will join me on this cyborg train. The road to superintelligence is gonna be winding with lots of stops and starts and dead ends, but we can make no mistake that we are in a race towards it. Thank <laughs> you.